So thank you for the, uh, the invitation to come and speak. I, um, I became acquainted with um, Bayesia Lab probably about uh, six months ago. Um, I was working in the area of decision support and my friend was using the neural networks. I didn't believe that neural networks were the way to go because I felt I knew all the weights. And then I discovered uh, uh, Bayesian networks. So we had some funding and I was digging down and I was, uh, I was working with those. Um, and then I came across Bayesian Lab and it did all the things that we were making lists of stuff that we would have to have software do for us. Um, so it was a wonderful discovery. I went and I did the introductory course this summer in uh, San Francisco and realized how little I knew about Bayesian networks, so I've been reading since. Um, and I'll give a little, little bit of background. I don't think I have a background slide here. But it'll give you a bit of context. So I, um, I'm a physician by training, a Canadian physician. I spent the first uh, 10 years of my career in the Air Force working with flight medicine. Um, went back to uh, university, went to the University of Texas, did a PhD in social psychology. I was working with um, astronauts and astronaut recruitment and pilot training and pilot recruitment and got pulled into space medicine as a really from the psychological side in terms of psychological support of astronauts and uh, screening and uh, in-flight support tools. Um, from then, uh, when my visa ran out and I went back to Canada, I, uh, I went to McMaster. I spent about eight years at McMaster and I was working at McMaster University in Hamilton and I was working in the um, uh, medical training and, uh, and simulation. And you're going to see some slides in a few seconds. Um, and then in the last four years, I've just been at uh, Northern Ontario School, which is a new medical school in Canada, and I run the MD training program. Um, and I'm just in the process of stepping away from that to do this stuff full time because it's growing and it's growing and I can't keep doing it as a side interest. So I'm on the verge of jumping away from academia into the uh, um, slightly different commercial sector. Um, so hopefully this works. I uh, think this should work. There. Um, so we're going to talk about going to Mars. Sorry, the is that a little bit better like that? Um, yeah, I'll just keep my mouth away from the microphone. How's that? It's counterintuitive. How's that? Is that better? Maybe if I stand out out here, it's a bit better. I'm not even sure about the video because we're in the middle of a competition trying to get Canadian funding and uh, it's a question of if you're going to post this online when you post it. Uh, hopefully after the, um, after the uh, government runs the competition uh, because a lot of our secrets for our company are in, are in this. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about though is, uh, is, is actually managing illness and an approach to managing illness on the International Space Station which has been the, for 17 years has been the dominant um, uh, space flight experience for uh, astronauts from all around the world. And, cosmonauts from around the world. And it really it hinges on four things. So uh, screening the astronauts really, really carefully and keeping them really, really healthy before you send them up so it has the least chance of something going wrong when they're up in space. Um, there are very limited treatment capabilities on the space station. There's you know, essentially a first aid kit and a few pieces of equipment. All of the medical care, sorry, that's really, all of the medical care is delivered uh, really through telemedicine and the primary means of dealing with anything that's serious is just to climb um, into this thing, I think you can actually see it here. That little blip right there is a, uh, is a Russian Soyuz capsule. And if somebody gets really sick, they just stuff them in there and then dump them out and they, they fall back to Earth and they get treated on Earth. So there's about an eight hour, eight to 12 hour, depending on where the uh, uh, station is, um, period of getting somebody back on Earth and then you've got to get them from wherever they land to a hospital. But you're certainly looking at 24 hours or less than 24 hours to go from being extremely sick on the space station to being in a, in a, a proper care facility. That's the, primary, that's the primary approach to managing anything on the space station. And the space station was never built to manage anything complex. And you can see an example here. This is actually not medical care. This is a medical study. So there's certainly a lot more medical research on the space station than there is medical care required. Um, and this is somebody getting an ultrasound of their, of their shoulder. There are ultrasound machines. There are ECGs. And there are limited capabilities of things like airway management, oxygen, defibrillators, these kinds of things. Um, but it's not an extensive amount of, of medical support equipment. Um, but this is where everybody wants to go, right? So depending on what, um, what year or what decade um, you're floating in and out of uh, NASA and ESA meetings, the destination always kind of changes, but it always goes back to Mars. So this one is a fairly recent slide. And what it's, this, is, this is really reflective of the current 
thinking internationally, which is uh, right now we're here on the space station. Somewhere in the next 10 years, we expect to be somewhere around the moon, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, and it may or may not say here, cislunar. Yeah, it does right here. Beginning missions to cislunar space. That means nothing to most people. Um, but it's really a stepping point of going on to, uh, to other destinations of which the uh, final target is Mars. And that's, uh, it says after 2030, it's always a question of funding. You could go in five years if somebody was going to fund you $400 billion, uh, but nobody's funding things at that level, and certainly not since the 1960s. Um, so it's a bit of a slow process. And the question is, will the current model uh, of medical support work for missions to cislunar and lunar surface, what are called near asteroid missions or Mars? And the, the answer you're going to get, obviously, is no. Um, uh, this is an ESA, um, a lot of conceptual art in uh, space, because people want to do things, and nobody ever funds it, so they use some of the funding to draw pictures of what they'd like to do. Um, and everybody wants to go back to the moon, at least a lot of people do. Um, and as soon as you start talking about how expensive it is to go back to the moon, suddenly nobody wants to go back to the moon because it's going to interfere with going to Mars. And then about every five years, the system gets grounded again, and everybody realizes you can't do anything on Mars until you've done it on the moon first. Um, Mars is a lot further away. If I, uh, if I hold this little thing about a foot in front of my, my face, Mars is somewhere on the other side of the uh, John Han Hancock Tower. It's, a, it's about 1,000 to 1 in terms of distance if you work it out. So it's a long, long way to Mars, and to not have a, a stepping stone to get there to prove the technology is not going to be likely. But... Uh, that just raises the budget of the whole program, and then uh, Congress in the U.S. frowns, and the Canadian government frowns, and ESA frowns. So those ten things tend to get hidden a little bit. Um, and cislunar is the, the big buzzword, and probably, I mean, who knows what cislunar means? Um, I've been in the space uh, aviation medicine world for 30 years, and I didn't know what cislunar meant. Um, it's like cis as in the same as in cisgender, or, uh, or in chemistry, uh, uh, cis molecules, it means on the same side. Um, so if you look at the 400,000 kilometer or 250,000 mile trip to the moon, cislunar is that area between the Earth and the moon. It's on the same side of the moon. Um, and uh, people kind of wonder why would you want to go just to space on this side of the moon. And the key are these little weird things which are called Lagrangian points. And these are sort of like little gravity wells that form when you do a, a two or three body gravitational equation. And if you plant a, uh, I just I was hunting around earlier, I found this thing. And the GIF actually works in a PowerPoint. If you park your space station in any one of the four Lagrangian or five Lagrangian points, um, it'll just keep rotating around in a fixed system. And there's a lot of advantage to that. So if you're going to build a space station and put it somewhere out in space, uh, not too far away, the Lagrangian points, especially the, uh, the little one here right next to the moon, is a very, um, uh, very popular place to start conceptualizing where you want to put these things for all kinds of reasons. Uh, gravitation, navigation, um, communication, satellites, all these things. So the, the current thinking right now at NASA, and that kind of spreads throughout the space world, is that the next big mission is going to be to a cislunar station, something a little bit smaller than ISS, but it's going to be parked up by the moon. Um, so that's coming. Uh, another thing that you'll see um, quite often uh, talked about, and it seems to come and go about every four or five years, but is a near-Earth asteroid mission. So sending asteroids out either that are flying by the Earth, but there's never enough time to actually plan for those, um, or going a little bit further out towards some known asteroids orbit and uh, swinging by and grabbing some uh, soil samples and some stone samples. Um, so that's certainly on the agenda right now. But the thing that everybody really wants to do is go to Mars. And this is from the Martian. A lot of us who are working in the space world, um, the Martian produced a lot of good graphical material for presentations because it's very accurate. And it was, uh, the movie was made with a lot of consultation with the, uh, with the um, spaceflight world. Um, so a lot of when, when you see the stuff in the movie, if you've seen the movie, most people have seen it, a lot of that reflects sort of current state of the art and thinking about the technology. So that's where people want to go. Um, and if you plot these things out, um, there's a graph I made, if, it's, if you look logarithmically from one day to 10 days to 100 days to 1,000 days in terms of how long does it take you to get back and how long is your mission, you can look at something like Apollo. It's a 10 or 14 day mission, but back then they can get back in about three or four days if they had to. There's a real relative point to this stuff, and this can become very obvious. Um, the shuttle, um, again, sort of a roughly a maximum of a two-week mission, and it could always come back. Bless you. It could always come back in about uh, about 24 hours. It's just a question of what it's flying over and where it wants to land, and just lining up the orbit, and then coming back from uh, from space. Um, ISS, the space station, you can stay up there for you know currently people have stayed up for three or four hundred days, sort of a one year plus. There've been a number of people now. But again, if you want to come back to Earth, you can get back in a day. So in all three of these models, 
um, medical care for serious stuff is really just repatriate, repatriate. They climb in the thing or they change their uh, direction or they fire the rockets and they're back on Earth. Um, cis lunar is not too different. It's a question of where it is. It'll probably take uh, three or four or five days to get back. And the current mission uh, plans are two, three month missions, maybe as long as that. Certainly 30 to 60 days at start. But these are all sort of a, a common class of mission until you get to things like near-Earth near asteroids where it's going to take a, a three months, uh, plus or minus a couple months, to get there and about the same amount of time to get back. And there's not much you can do about getting back except just riding your rocket all the way around. So this is the, those are the first missions that we're going to see where if somebody gets really sick, they're just not coming back. And that shifts the whole paradigm of how you deal with medicine in spaceflight because now you need diagnostic and treatment and support capabilities that were never planned for before. It also means they've never been designed, they've never been implemented, they've never been tested. Um, so that's a big unknown. And when you get to Mars, you're looking at, uh, these numbers are really scary. We don't like to show them to the astronauts because they lose enthusiasm. Um, you know, the, the numbers I've seen, I think uh, people are talking about uh, three-year missions, you know, two and a half year missions. I did my minor in aerospace engineering. I can tell you that that's not gonna happen. It's a, it's a three to five year mission to get there. It's, I don't have slides on it, but. The only way you get to Mars from Earth is you get off the ground at Earth and you give it a humongous rocket boost and you slowly orbit the sun until eventually you connect with Mars. And that's about a, uh, that's at least an 18 month trip. Um, you can stay on the ground for maybe 60 days and then you come back for another 18 months and at that level you've got maybe three years, absolute minimum three year mission. And if you're gonna stay on the surface for more than about two or three months, you miss the little window where the planets are act, um, adequately aligned and you gotta wait maybe two years until the, the uh, two planets are aligned again before you can come back. So anywhere from three to five years for those missions, which really changes the whole idea of what you've got to bring and what you've got to do and what skills you bring along and what equipment you need. So the, 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 the gripping reality, and this is where it's always bad to have these things taped, but um, space agencies in general are run by pilots and scientists and engineers and not doctors and certainly not psychologists. Uh, there's a very famous quote, I think, from... Um, I think it was Joe Kerwin, uh, one of the Apollo astronauts who always said that the, uh, the astronauts would only be happy when the last flight surgeon, that's a physician doctor, is strangled to death with the entrails of the last psychologist. Um, so the psychologists and the physicians don't really have a lot of say in this stuff. And it's really great for people like me because in the last 10 years or 15 years, we now have this, uh, we, we drive the design of the, of the mission and we drive the design of the equipment because the really limiting factor in all this stuff now becomes the human being. It's not the equipment, it's not the rockets, it's not the navigation. All that stuff is done. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the frail human being in there and then building the system around that human being to, to uh, get them to survive. Um, the second thing, so we looked at uh, the last slide showed you the, the, uh, how long it's gonna take to get them back and that's primarily a function of orbital dynamics and mission design. Uh, but the further you go away, the the longer the time delay of communication. Um, radio waves travel at the speed of light, which is usually not a problem <laughs> um, when, uh, when you're transmitting a couple hundred miles and even at the moon. So if you look at the cis lunar missions on this thing, you can stay up there for months, but you only ever have a one or two or three second time delay and half of that is gonna be relaying from satellite to the ground to satellite uh, because light and radio waves travel between here and the moon very quickly. When you look at the near Earth asteroid missions, they're gonna go way, way, way out, maybe halfway to Mars, and then come back again. And now you're looking at sort of this growing 20 minute time delay. And when you go to Mars, now you're looking at 45 minute time delays. So I can say, uh, hi Lionel, how are you doing? And it wait, I have to wait 45 minutes for it to come back saying, I'm good, what's up? I'll say, I've got a pain in my abdomen. Um, and it'll go to you and it'll come back and you'll say, I didn't quite hear that. And I'll say, my abdomen. And so the whole idea of doing telemedicine in real time um, it's gonna be like writing letters and rolling them up and, uh, and sending them across the ocean on a sailing ship. So, so the idea that you can have real-time communication will, uh, will diminish very rapidly within the first uh, three or four weeks of the mission to the point, even, uh, you'll see some pictures. We've played with communication time delays of four seconds and eight seconds, and you cannot have a conversation with anybody with a four second time delay unless you're trained in it because people just start talking over each other and, and they start answering the wrong questions. Um, this is a graphic from a Scientific American a number of years ago. Um, um, it's just a reminder there for me to talk about uh, very, very briefly. I think somebody earlier said that uh, uh, this is like an eight-week course being presented in 30 minutes. This is like 30 years of research being condensed down to 30 minutes. 
um, and certainly at least a year-long graduate course in space medicine or a two-year residency. Um, but you can, what you can see, if you look at this graphic very, very quickly, uh, it just highlights some of the major changes that we see in spaceflight. Things like uh, bones start dissolving and deteriorating, the muscles get thin, the dissolving bones put calcium into the blood, uh, blood uh, goes through the kidney, starts making kidney stones with all the extra calcium, uh, starts affecting how the nerves work, um, including a lack of proprioception and these kinds of things. That all changes. Fluid redistributes, so you get more fluid up in your head and your face gets puffy. We've seen uh, changes in internal ocular pressure that haven't really gone away after people come back to Earth. Um, so we're starting to look at some permanent changes when we see these people that have been up there for a year or so. Um, we know there are um, uh, brain effects, neurologic effects, a whole slew of these things. And you can really break them down to three things, at least three causes that we're aware of, right? So the first one is microgravity. That's a, some of you remember, that's a great picture from Skylab. Um, we have yet to ever produce anything as big and massive as Skylab in the 1970s. Um, but the lack of gravity affects uh, muscles, proprioception, fluid shifts, cardiovascular systems, all these things, uh, that changes. Um, radiation, which has not been, uh, that's a, I think an ESA graphic. Um, uh, we put people in low Earth orbit and they get a little bit of radiation, but it's not that much because low Earth orbit um, is sort of sitting down around here underneath the Van Allen belts, which surround the Earth. And the Van Allen belts both trap radiation and protect us from cosmic rays. So there's all kinds of nasty things coming from outer space that when they come here, they kind of just can't penetrate. They get stuck in here. They get bounced off. A lot of particles from the sun that kind of get blown around the Earth's magnetic field. As soon as you start traveling away from this thing, um, you're out there in the, in the brutal radiation reality of space. And we don't even have models for this stuff. We have, you know, when we talk about radiation on Earth, like around nuclear reactors and all that stuff, um, uh, even, a, even atomic bombs. We're looking at alpha particles, beta particles, things that go through your cells and mutate your chromosomes and increase your cancer risk and hurt your skin and stuff like that. When you go out far enough, like sort of to the moon and beyond, now you're talking about cosmic rays. So instead of having hydrogen ions with no, no electrons around, you've got like nickel ions and, and, uh, and uh, just the, um, the nuclei from iron atoms. And these things are brutally powerful. So when they go flying through your body, they'll hit a cell and they'll kill the cell on the way through. They're like cannonballs versus BBs. And you can't shield against it. You can put six inches of steel plate. All it does is just shatter and come out as a whole raft of, of uh, subatomic particles on the other side. It's, a, it's literally, like, literally like protecting against BBs versus cannonballs. Um, and we don't have good models for that. We've, we do have these studies where we take these poor little mice and put them into a big cyclotron uh, and hammer away at them for a, for a day or two and, and take them out and look at how much of their brain has survived. So these things are not known, but we do know that radiation in space is, is incredibly significant. Uh, and the last one is, um, uh, is loneliness and isolation and separation from family and separation from psychological supports. We don't really have um, existing psychological models um, based on experience of how people function. Highly, highly intelligent, extremely driven people um, who are very eager to do this stuff who are then in a group of three or four or six people for two years, four years, five years in a small confined environment, even though it looks like it's kind of nice to go out on the, for a, a walk on the surface of Mars like in the movie, it's a little bit like scuba diving at a thousand feet. In reality, people are, gonna, people are gonna go out for a, you know, hour and a half every three weeks, um, like a spacewalk. It's, a, it's again, a brutally difficult environment. You can't see it there, but Mars has very little magnetic field. So the whole surface will be bombarded by radioactive particles you don't get on Earth. So it's brutal environments. Um, all these things add to all the things that we would all get if we were sitting somewhere for two years or three years or four years. We'd all get appendicitis. We'd all get you know, a stuffed up nose sometimes. We'd all have uh, you know, cardiovascular disease progressing in our bodies and all these things. But you add to the environment, you've got a lot more medical complexity. And we've been studying this for years. That's a, that's a slide of the uh, tectite undersea habitat. My uh, PhD advisor spent his graduate years on the surface in the Virgin Islands, which is how you want to go through graduate school, um, administering questionnaires to these guys. We've gone to the Arctic. This is the Houghton Mars Project Research Station on um, Devon Island in the Arctic. It's run by CSA and NASA. And uh, we've run things like medical simulations. You can say I look, I have less gray hair in that picture. Um, and that was about 10 years ago. We, we dragged mannequins up there and we were, we were using the station personnel trying to figure out how they would manage these things if we threw them. This guy's a bit more traumatized than we normally use. Um, he's not real, right? He's a, he's a mannequin. 
Um, that's why nobody looks too concerned about them. Um, but we looked at telemedicine. We had people back down south in, in Chicago and uh, actually right here, uh, and uh, Hamilton and New York, people that we were collaborating with, um, uh, supervising these, these uh, station people, uh, geologists, microbiologists, um, uh, computer IT people that were on the station, having, running them through these things. And it's exciting for them. Most of the patients didn't survive. Um, but you add a two second or four second or six second time delay on top of that complexity and everything just falls apart. Uh, it's very, very complicated. Uh, we've done this recently. This is in the last uh, year. We've, uh, we were funded by NASA. This is uh, Stephen Ewell at, at uh, the Brigham in uh, Boston and myself. So we built this incredible, and uh, Tom Doyle, I should say Tom. Tom's the engineer who, built, who uh, designed it for us. Um, essentially, it's a mock-up of the Destiny module on the space station, um, the dimensions anyway, and uh, uh, we put a table in it, and again, we run our mannequin through looking at, what, looking at what people can do. We pump smoke into it. It's a great fun machine. It's like a torture chamber. Um, and we run our little astronaut crews through it to see what they're, how they're able to respond. Um, and they can get by with some things. Um, they struggle with others. And so the question is, do we just need to train our astronauts more so they can handle this stuff? And we do this. So that's, um, that's David Saint-Jacques, who's a Canadian astronaut, and Jeremy Hansen. Uh, David Saint-Jacques is going up on the next uh, Russian um, launch. Remember, the last one didn't go too well. That's the one they had to eject. So there's been some rescheduling, and suddenly David's going up um, in about four weeks. So good luck to him. Um, and he's bringing a bunch of medical monitoring stuff, because the Canadian Space Agency and NASA are both now starting to do a lot more funded work in, um, in medical support. But there's a limit to what you can get them to do. So you can give them some intubation skills, you can give them some suturing skills. Um, David's an experienced uh, physician. Jeremy's a F-18 pilot who's now an astronaut. Um, so generally we would rely more on the uh, medically trained astronauts, but at the most you're gonna get one per crew. The injured person may be the astronaut, uh, who's the physician. Um, and we do know that the training for these missions is brutal. I think uh, David was recruited about 10 years ago and has been training for his ISS mission most of the last 10 years. So what we see with the physician astronauts is it's extremely hard to maintain their medical skills, and they certainly can't maintain medical skills at the level of a, of a cardiovascular surgeon or a brain surgeon. I mean, they can, they can maintain general medical skills, but if you want to give them something complex, um, they won't have seen it for a long time. And they have a lot of other responsibilities to do. So you've seen the arrival in the last little while, and I'm sorry, I should, there's no clock, so I don't have a good sense of time, but. Um, so there's been an emerging concept in the last five or ten years of the advanced medical support system. And uh, CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, has been calling it ACMS, the Advanced Crew Medical System. Um, NASA's got a couple of names for it. The current one is uh, uh, MDA, the Medical Database Architecture. Um, they're the same kinds of ideas. An integrated system that, that will provide significant support to the crew and the crew medical officer. Um, at the center of this thing is a decision support system, which is why I'm here, and which is why I'm looking at um, Bayesian networks, and we'll talk about some of the needs of those things. The other thing that's really important to understand is that semi-autonomous and autonomous operations are completely foreign in the space program. The way the space programs have run in all countries who have space programs, certainly the U.S. and Russia uh, paramount, is complete micromanagement of the crew. Every aspect of the crew day is scheduled by the ground. Every bolt that's removed is... Um, is instructed uh, from the ground, the, the timing is scheduled, they go out on a spacewalk because NASA mission control or uh, Russian mission, mission control has a mission for them, and it's all run completely, um, I don't want to say micromanaged, but all operational decisions are run by mission control. It literally is the control for the mission. Um, and uh, the idea of handing over medical care and all the complex diagnostics and drug dispensing to the crew is a completely foreign concept. So culturally, this is in the midst of a major transformation in how we control space missions, how we run missions. Um, and it's interesting as an outsider uh, to watch the agencies kind of struggle with that because it really means that at every tier of how they manage their programs, they're really having to relinquish control to the crew, which is, uh, which is an, a very foreign concept. So to run one of these systems, and we've been looking at these, I'd say, for uh, three years. So my little company, Lunar Medical, we formed that actually as an entity to bid against government contracts that were restricted only to companies because we were academics and um, space, agencies, space agencies come up with research grants and we all apply for them. We're like, we're like fish, you just sprinkle the food anywhere and we, we all come to it for funding. Um, and then they created these uh, commercial entities. So being academics, we decided to form a company so we could apply for those too. 
Um, so basically, we fund our research through, uh, through two different lines. I think that's a pretty common, uh, common approach. Um, but we, uh, we revised and, and, and advanced sort of the overall architecture on the Canadian side for a, an advanced uh, crew support system. Um, and we're, we have sort of uh, Canada and the US are pretty close. They're uh, close physically, but close culturally. And they're close at the space agency level. So um, there's a significant amount of discussion going on right now between uh, CSA and uh, NASA about which parts of this system the two countries will design. Um, but if you look at the, I've just jotted some stuff down, it's off the top of my head, obviously. But uh, certainly as we're looking at this, we want knowledge-based models from terrestrial experience. If I know how to diagnose appendicitis on the Earth, I think it's going to look kind of the same in space. So I've got a, I've got a model on, on what questions I would ask, what tests I would order, um, and how I would interpret those results. We also know that things are different in space flight. And we have a very limited amount of experience. We've had you know, a few hundred people have gone up in space, um, mostly for a small number of days. So the collective human experience of space flight medicine is extremely small. So it's informed largely by the ground, but we do find that new stuff keeps popping up all the time. So that's going to be part of this advanced system as well. Um, we have a lot of expert opinion based on, well, given the way uh, the body responds to space, we think it would look more like this if it were to occur. So we have this sort of beyond the, the standard subject matter expertise, which we rely on a lot for the knowledge-based models. There's also the whole idea of how sp medicine will be different in space, which is, uh, which is a much smaller subset of subject matter experts, but we have some strong opinions out there on how these things would behave. Um, and we're going to collect lots of in-flight data. That's already underway. There are you know, sensor vests that uh, astronauts are currently trialing. That's what David St. Jacques will be doing as part of his mission, wearing a sensor vest and just feeding you know, uh, biometric telemetry the whole time. So modeling this stuff with machine language, uh, machine uh, learning, and trying to figure out what's normal and what's normal, what's abnormal in space flight. We don't have good models of that, so this will all be happening simultaneously. So all these elements need to be combined into, a, into an expert system. Um, and the, uh, the requirements for the expert system are going to be pretty clearly that it has to have these different data sources because we don't have a standard single, um, even huge domain like terrestrial medicine. We have multiple domains we have to incorporate. Uh, it's got to be able to learn over time because we expect that one of the main missions, main requirements, or at least one of the main outcomes from a mission to Mars is that's when we get our first long-term deep space biological data. Physiologic modeling, um, immune responses, changes in chromosomes, all these things that we've been looking at in, on ISS we're going to see these things to a much greater degree now um, going to Mars, there's no question. So the system has to be able to kind of both uh, record that information, but also understand it and integrate it. Uh, it's got to be modifiable because we expect to not just progress in, in uh, standard Earth medicine, but uh, we expect to be learning a lot about human uh, physiology during the mission. Um, we're also in the era of personalized medicine. We know that everybody has a different genetic profile. You have different responses to different drugs, uh, different likelihood of getting different illnesses. Uh, there's no question that the genetic code for each uh, astronaut will be entered into this system. And as we learn stuff about genetics and its impact on specific health um, uh, occurrences, that that will be incorporated in the system as well. Um, and queryable, and this is also where the, uh, the idea of Bayesian networks is very, very useful. So you, you're probably aware of advancing legislation, I think in Europe more so than uh, on this side of the Atlantic, but it's coming, that you can't use black box neural networks to diagnose everything. Nobody trusts it. <laughs> and if you say, well, I don't know what you've got, but I've just hooked you up to a bunch of sensors, and the black box is saying you better take this uh, noxious pill. And you go, ooh, how come? I don't know. It's just telling, it's, it's telling us that's what you need. Um, that's becoming unacceptable. So you have to be able to query the system and say, why do I take this obnoxious pill that's going to make me have all these side effects? And with uh, something like a Bayesian network, it'll actually give you the logical um, flow and the, and the likelihood decisions as to why that's the best outcome. So, uh, I think we're the only group right now that's looking at Bayesian networks for space medicine, but we do have a grant right now from the Canadian Space Agency to build a prototype model. Um, uh, it's queryable, and that's a hugely, hugely important. Uh, and reliability, so the idea that it's got to be validated, and that's really tough. Um, if I look at the challenges, the system scope is huge, because we, uh, many of you are aware of Bayesian networks being used in uh, diagnostics. We see them in pathology, we see them for breast lumps, we see them for interpreting biomarkers. Uh, you're starting to see them on, on uh, you're starting to see um, uh, neural networks and other machine learning uh, algorithms looking at x-rays. But this is everything, right? So this is not just a single illness, this is a range of illnesses. Maybe not at the level of complexity that you would see in an, in an oncology practice or in, a, or in a tertiary care radiology suite. 
Um, but we don't, nobody's really, there have been a handful, maybe less than a handful, less than a handful of, uh, of very widely um, scoped uh, expert systems for medicine. And they've always been essentially uh, sort of interesting um, research projects, but this would actually have to be a real one. So the number of systems that you would need, the number of illnesses that you would need to model in the system is vast. Uh, validation is hard. We don't have, uh, very few of these things have been well validated on Earth. You do see emerging products out there like URMD in the UK and Babylon Health and Ada, uh, I think URMD, and, and nobody knows what Google and Apple and, uh, uh, and Amazon are doing with health. It's all behind closed doors, but they're probably doing some of this stuff. But validating these systems is complicated. You actually need tons and tons of data. And we're not talking things like ECG data. We're talking symptomology and symptom reports and combining those with laboratory data. The number of databases where that stuff is in there and in a reliable manner, like somebody mentioned reliability of the data earlier about questioning it, those data, those data sets are not uh, that prominent. Um, there are some like MIMIC that involve physiologic monitoring in the ICU, but that's very different than the data you would need to have machine learned models of general practice medicine. Um, and we also know that environment matters. We know that we don't, we wouldn't have the same diagnostic logic. We wouldn't have the same, uh, in Bayesian terms, we wouldn't have the same weights in our model for what comes to the emergency department versus urgent care for a doctor's office. If you come into an emergency room with, a, with right lower quadrant pain, I'm thinking there's a 20 or 30% chance uh, that you've got appendicitis. Changes obviously are if you're female or male because it can be mimicked by uh, ovarian cysts and other things. But if, if you're talking to your friend over dinner and they say, oh yeah, I got a bit of a cramp, it's a much less likely diagnosis because people who present to emergency rooms are much sicker. So the, the likelihood of those symptoms producing a serious diagnosis changed depending on where that patient has gone, whether it's talking to their friend or they've gone into a, a, a downtown emergency room. Um, so learning from those data, and we've been doing some of that, it's great, but it's not necessarily transferable. Um, and right now, the, the subject matter expert knowledge is better than those learned models. So I challenge anybody to find me a um, primary care data set with all the symptoms that come through the door every day, with all the lab readings and accurate diagnosis, um, with a million entries in it. But we have like a million physicians in the world. We have at least uh, 300,000 in the US, and another 30,000 in Canada. In the heads of those individuals, they've seen collectively a lot of this experience. So if I'm going to try and get information, I'm going to pull most of it actually from practicing physicians as opposed to trying to learn it from data sets. But as we get further and further along on the space data collection, that's going to have to come from machine learning because we're collecting a lot of data on these folks. Um, and I think that's oh, yeah, the next step. So you're going to have to see uh, better international agency collaboration because everybody's building little bits of these systems and there's got to be a coordinated model. But like I said, some of that's happening now between Canada and the US, which is nice. Um, figuring out the system architecture, because it's not just the decision support thing. It's also uh, the data collection, the storage, the medical records, the interface, the telemedicine. So the overall architecture of this system, we've proposed one that I think the Canadian Space Agency is going with, but I know NASA has been funding one for the last three or four years. There's going to be some meeting of that. Um, prototype systems, like I said, we're funded by the uh, Canadian government right now to build one, so we're building one. It's a theoretical one. Uh, ground validation is going to be huge. Um, but what's going to really drive this actually is not Mars. It's going to be the terrestrial benefits. Because if you can build this advanced um, crew medical system that can do individual diagnostics for that astronaut in the absence of guidance from back home, you've just built a system that can surround anybody you put into it, which means you can put it around everybody. So it's the first time I've ever actually come across something that I would actually call truly um, patient-centric medicine. Patient-centric medicine is usually a hospital that has a marketing campaign that um, uh, wants to uh, try and convince them that they really care about their patients. But it's still a hospital and a physician-centric healthcare system. But this is a truly patient-centric one. It's built around the individual astronaut or a crew of three or four or five people. Um, so I think you're going to see as the systems start to realize that, and I think our government's realized it. Um, come back to that in a second. Because this, I, I actually took this off the web page of the Canadian Space Agency this morning. Um, and uh, it doesn't have the words on it, but the words underneath it that are uh, AI in medicine for spaceflight. So the Canadian Space Agency has just stepped up now and is, has highlighted uh, AI in medicine as one of their major foci for the next 10 years. Um, the Canadian Space Agency has been uh, known in the space world for building the robot arms, you know, the Canada arms. That's been our signature technology in spaceflight. So what you're seeing now is, uh, 
agencies, different space agencies, certainly ours in Canada, positioning itself now for AI and medicine as driven primarily by terrestrial benefits and potential spin-offs. So uh, that's all I'm going to talk about. I wanted to have a fairly visual presentation that didn't have a lot of data because it's the end of the day. But I will say uh, thanks to our funding. So we've been funded by uh, CSA and NASA for off and on for about 15 years. Um, uh, I've spent most of my time at McMaster. I still have an appointment there. So um, uh, Mac's been a big supporter of this. And uh, my current employer is Northern Ontario School of Medicine. And the Strata Sim Center at Harvard and the Brigham has um, really stepped up and given us space to build the simulator. And uh, again, our company, but we've worked with MDA, the robot arm people, and Globe Vision out of Montreal who does uh, uh, sensing networks. Um, but if this is of interest to any of you, there's my uh, email address. So we're ramping up. There's a huge amount of funding on the table right now in Canada, so we're positioning ourselves for it. Um, uh, this is not going away anytime soon. Um, the urge to go to Mars will continue to be there for the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, it certainly hasn't gone away since, um, since the 1980s. Uh, medical care has emerged now really as the primary barrier to going to Mars. It's nothing else. And, uh, and countries are, are, will be posturing and positioning for control of the medical system. Um, I think we're one of the few companies that really, really is looking at AI in both the uh, learned models and, uh, and SME program models um, to do this. So if you're interested in this stuff, I'm leaving this up long enough, you can write down my, uh, my email address. But send me your email. I mean, the, you guys are some of the few people in the world who work with this stuff on a daily basis. And uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. And both NASA and CSA, I know, are funding it. I'm not sure about ESA. ESA's done medical stuff for years, but I think you're going to find that the, uh, the overall system is driven by, uh, by those two agencies. So if you're interested, send me an email, and we can talk. Any? So I'll stop there, although I can go on for hours. <laughs> um,